A number of years ago, listening to John MacArthur preach to his congregation at Grace Community Church in Sun Valley, California. He had just returned after a summer sabbatical where he and his wife traveled across the United States visiting various evangelical churches, churches which would have had a doctrinal statement that we would have agreed on. Yet I was shocked what he discovered. He stated upon his return that the problem with the majority of evangelical churches in America is that the majority of the people in the pews are simply not saved. A few years later, John and his wife went on another sabbatical, again all across America. And this time he returned home to report that the problem with the majority of evangelical churches in America is not only that the majority of the people in the pews are not saved, but the majority of the deacons, the elders, and the pastors are simply not saved. The pastors are standing up in the pulpit and they are preaching, but never really declaring the truth of Scripture. People in the congregation are singing and fellowshipping, but somehow their lives never seem to match their profession of faith. What is alarming is that the majority of these people believe that when they die, they're going into heaven, when in fact, many will, if not the majority, on the day of death, find themselves in the fires of hell. I am reminded of what Jesus said, as recorded in the book of Matthew, chapter 7, verse 22 and 23, where he said, many, that means multitudes, multitudes will say to me on that day, the last day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name drive out demons and perform many miracles? Then he said, I will tell them plainly, I never knew you away from me, you evildoers. Those people, they went to church on Sundays, they went to Sunday school, to Bible studies, to church fellowships, they read their Bibles, but still they did not have that personal relationship, that personal and intimate relationship with Jesus Christ which caused Jesus to say, Depart from me, I never knew you. Now our message today is a true story. It is a true story told by Jesus of two men, one who happened to be very rich and very religious, that was absolutely convinced that he was going to heaven, yet he ended up in hell. And the other man was a poor beggar and was considered by the culture that he lived in to be cursed by God and on his way to hell, but he ends up in heaven. Now during this story, we are given a supernatural peek into hell in which we will see and listen to the rich man having a very brief conversation with Abraham, the patriarch of Israel. And we will discover how the rich man ended up in hell and what he needed to have done to have avoided that judgment. Now, to set the context of the story that was told by Jesus, he had been talking to the Pharisees just a few verses before. He was talking to the religious elite in Israel, who were very jealous of Jesus and his ministry and was opposing him continually every day. We see in the previous encounter with these Pharisees, who were lovers of money, that Jesus told them that they could not serve both God and money. That was in verse 13. And their response in verse 14, it says the Pharisees who loved money heard all of this that Jesus said, and they sneered at Jesus. That means they gave him a very mocking smile. The Pharisees had a convenient theology. The more money you make, the more you were blessed by God. That was their view. But the truth is in verse 15, when Jesus says they were detestable in God's sight. Because they loved money and did not, in fact, obey Moses and the prophets, the word of God in the Old Testament. Now, if you have your Bibles, please turn with me to Luke chapter 16, verse 19 to 31, as I read the text. Luke chapter 16, verses 19 to 31. I'll be reading in the NIV. There was a rich man. He was dressed in purple and fine linen and lived in luxury every day. At his gate was laid a beggar named Lazarus, covered with sores, and longing to eat 
what fell from the rich man's table. Even the dogs came and licked his sores. Now the time came when the beggar died and the angels carried him to Abraham's side. The rich man also died and was buried. In hell, where he was in torment, he looked up and saw Abraham far away, with Lazarus by his side. So he called to him, Father Abraham, have pity on me, and send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, because I am in agony in this fire. But Abraham replied, Son, remember that in your lifetime you received good things, while Lazarus received bad things. But now he is comforted here, and you are in agony. And besides all this, between us and you, a great chasm has been fixed, so that those who want to go from here to you cannot, nor can anyone cross over from there to us. He answered, the rich man answered, Then I beg you, Father, send Lazarus to my father's house, for I have five brothers. Let him warn them, so that they will not also come to this place of torment. And Abraham replied, They have Moses and the prophets. Let them listen to them. But the rich man said, No, Father Abraham. But if someone from the dead goes to him, they will repent. And Moses said to him, If they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, they will not be convinced even if someone rises from the dead. Let us pray before I begin the message. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you that this is, a, this is a tough passage. It's one that's not preached much. Our society, even the churches, do not preach on hell. And yet you, my Lord, preached on hell more than anyone else in the scriptures. And you are a God of love. And that is a loving message to warn people so they don't end up there. Please bless this time. Holy Spirit, Use me, use my mouth to declare your word and only your word for the glory of Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. Now, I have divided this message into three major points today. The first will be two different lives on earth, two different lives on earth. Secondly, we'll look at two different lives in eternity. And lastly, we'll look at two different gospels that were believed. We start out with two different lives on earth. And we'll follow our text. Verse 19, there was a rich man. He was a real person. He's not named, though. And that's interesting because God names Lazarus, but he doesn't name the rich man. And you'll say, why didn't he name him? Well, we go back to Proverbs chapter 10, verse 7. And God says, the memory of the righteous will be a blessing, but the name of the wicked will rot. That means it will perish, it will decay, it will be forgotten. Now, the rich man is the main character in this whole dialogue. Again, in that culture, they believed that rich people were blessed by God and their poor people were cursed. This was their idea, not God's. The Pharisees, who were the religious leaders, would be also rich. And they became rich because they took advantage of their position. We find a number of places in the Bible where they are fleecing not only the poor, but the widows of their land so they can increase their wealth. Now, the rich man in the story was likely not a Pharisee, but a very, very, very wealthy businessman. It says, as we continue on in that verse, he was dressed in purple and fine linen and lived in luxury every day, to give us an idea of how rich he was. To be dressed in purple, now that would have been his outer garment. It's a robe worn in those days by the very, very wealthy. And it was made of a very expensive type of wool, which was first put through a very lengthy process to make the wool very bright, almost brilliant white. And then to make it even more luxurious, they would have it dyed in a rare and very expensive sort of purple dye produced from the muric shellfish known as Tyron, which came from the area of Tyre. The color was, in many cultures of that ancient time, 
reserved for the use of royalty or at least nobility. So he was very, very rich. And then it says, he also was dressed in fine linen. Now the fine linen would have been the undergarment, a tunic that he wore underneath the robe. Most likely this would have been made of the finest linen available of the day, which was Egyptian cotton, which is still today considered one of the finest linens in the world. It was the most expensive cotton, which had the highest thread count. And the rich man wore this fine linen fresh every day. He just didn't dress up once in a while. Every day he wore his purple garments and this fine linen. And it means dressed. That very word dressed in the Greek means continually putting on. Continually, every day, even throughout the day, as he went from different feasts to different functions. And when it said he lived in luxury every day, that word luxury comes from the Greeks, means where he was radiant with happiness. He was the star of every feast and every gathering, and he relished in how he looked and all the wealth that he had. He would have been honored and envied by everyone, for God had obviously blessed him beyond measure. The center of the Jewish life back then, as it always has been, was their temple worship. And this rich man would have been given a special seat of honor in the temple. And he would have assumed also that God loved him more than others, and he would therefore have been very religious, playing the part of being highly favored by God. Most likely, he even had his own copy of the Holy Scriptures, the Old Testament, which was very expensive back then because they were hand-copied. But we see in the next verse, in verse 20, the story takes a sudden turn from this beauty and opulence of this rich man. We're now introduced to the poor man. It says in verse 20, At his gate was laid a beggar, or it could be translated a poor man, named Lazarus, covered with sores. Now Lazarus, it was a very common name in Israel, and we would just want to note that this is not the same Lazarus that Jesus raised from the dead. But that was his name, Lazarus. And he was laid at the rich man's gate. The normal word for gate is not used here. Rather, the word used to mean large gate, big gate, typically used for ornate gate, and implies that he had quite an estate which would fit and would have been a gate to his courtyard where his mansion is located. Now, they did not have long driveways back then. The house would have been fairly close to this gate. And the idea is that the rich man and all of his friends would daily come and go from that gate, and there was laid a beggar. The Greek word used, it means extreme poverty, that he was a beggar, that he was worthless in the sense that he had no worth whatsoever, no money, nothing of value, just himself. You also understand that back then there was no welfare system, there were no food stamps, and if you couldn't work, you would not eat. You had to beg for food. However, God commanded Israel to care for the poor and needy. Way back in Deuteronomy chapter 15 and 11, this is what God said. There will always be poor people in the land. Therefore, I command you to be open-handed towards your brothers and towards the poor and the needy in your land. Now you can see how corrupt Judaism had become by the time of Christ when they absolutely detested anyone poor and considered them cursed of God. It says the beggar was laid at the gate. Probably the reason why he was so poor is that he was unable to walk. He had to be carried. He could have been paralyzed from birth, or it could have been due to an accident. Now again, at that time, the corrupt religious leaders taught that the poor were under the curse of God. And those who were rich really despised the poor. Even the Pharisees despised the poor. Now sadly, as you read through this text, you look at the Greek translation that they used for the word that they translated laid at the gate. It doesn't mean laid. It means he was thrown down at the gate. This poor man who had nothing, sores all over his body, and someone took him to the gate and just threw him down like trash. There was no compassion for this poor man, none whatsoever. Continues on and says that Lazarus was covered with sores. Now this would indicate that likely he was dressed in ragged clothes, for the many sores are exposed. And these sores most likely were due to poor nutrition, being thrown to the ground, 
and of course, no medical care whatsoever. And it continues on that this poor man, Lazarus, was longing to eat what fell from the rich man's table. And then they said even the dogs came and licked his sores. He had a longing desire. He had a passion to eat whatever fell from the rich man's table. Lazarus was starving. It's implied that he was not receiving anything from the rich man because he had this passion, this longing to eat anything that would come from that table. He's not waiting for the next handout from the rich man to come regularly throughout the day. The rich man didn't say, take this out for the poor man. He did not. The poor man was being ignored. One commentator said that Lazarus was treated like he was roadkill. They wouldn't even look at him. And he was longing to eat what fell from the rich man's table. Now back then, their meals were a lot different than today, obviously. Food often fell from the table. Not quite like the food that a small child or children dropped to the floor now and then. They had no knives. They had no forks, spoons, or napkins. They ate with their hands. And they would take fresh bread often and dip it into stew or thick soup. And they would get some on their hands. They ate their meats with their hands. So their hands would get gooey. To clean their messy hands, they had stacks of stale bread on the table. Stale bread that no one wanted to eat. But they used the stale bread to wipe their messy hands. And then the practice was to take the stale, wet, dirty bread and throw it under the table. And you say, not at my house. But that's what they did. And the cleanup crew was the dogs. The dogs would come, and they kept the under-table area clean. Well, sort of. Now, these were not cute little pet dogs, little foo-foo dogs. These were wild, ugly dogs who roamed the streets and went from house to house to eat food under the tables. And they were welcome because they were the cleanup crew. Now, the sad thing is, Lazarus could see that, see the dogs go in, the dogs come out, and he passionately longed to go under that table with the dogs to eat what he could, but he couldn't move and no one would take him there. Then, this strange statement, when it said, even the dogs came and licked his sores. Even the dogs came and licked his sores. Now, the best we can guess, what the dogs were doing was actually an act of mercy from the Lord. They say that dogs and many other animals have an antiseptic qualities in their saliva. Human saliva doesn't have this. So while the dogs would probably enjoy the activity, the one being licked might benefit in this situation. The dogs would have promoted healing by licking Lazarus' wounds since dog saliva contains an antibacterial enzyme which stimulates the skin around the wound through the licking, which would increase the healing blood flow in the area. Dogs often lick their own wounds to encourage them to heal, and you know that if you have dogs. By licking Lazarus' wounds, these dogs are showing him compassion, which I believe that was of the Lord. Now, the National Geographic, as a side note, reported that archaeologists found in Ashkelon, Israel, recently uncovered a center where they found 1,300 dogs were buried, and there were no trauma or cut marks in the individual plots of the dogs, revealing that they died natural deaths. And the site has now been identified as a Phoenician semi-religious center where the sick could go, pay a fee, and you have these trained dogs come and lick their wounds as medical treatment. The dogs that came to Lazarus were most likely not trained dogs, but the wild dogs of the times, but the sovereign Lord of the universe can make these dogs treat a person with kindness. So, we have thus far seen two different lives on earth. The rich man living a, living a life of ease and comfort and opulence, luxury, extreme self-indulgence, a lavish lifestyle, and the best foods that money could buy. And just a few yards from him at his gate was the beggar Lazarus, who lived a life of destitution, poverty, pain, hunger, no wealth, no health, no food, no friends, and he was scorned by society and considered a curse by God. But now, death comes. And very typical, when death comes, it changes everything. It always does. So we look at our second point, two different lives in eternity. We start at verse 22, and it says, The time came when the beggar died, and angels carried him to Abraham's side. 
the rich man also died and was buried. Now first we look at the eternal life of Lazarus. The time came when the beggar died, and angels carried him to Abraham's side. And we know in Ecclesiastes 3.2, it says we have all been appointed a time to be born and a time to die. This is decreed before we are born and cannot change. Before the universe was formed, even way back before Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, in that white space, way back, it was appointed when we would be born and when we would die. And this was always in the mind of God, who's always existed. Each person that would ever be born, God already had a time and a place when they would be born and a time and a place when they would die. And we have no control over the date of our birth. Over the day of our birth, we had no control. We were going along for the ride. And we have no control, likewise, over the day of our death. We can't advance it. We can't shorten the time. We cannot do that. In Acts 17.26, God goes so far to say that He, Acts 17.26, God determines the times set for us and the exact places where we should live. God picks the exact generation He wants us born in, the exact parents we would be born to, and the exact location. And why does he do this? Verse 27 of Acts 17. God did this so that men would seek him and perhaps reach out for him and find him, though he is not far from each one of us. I was born in Ohio. I was born again in Indiana. And that was the ideal place for me to come to Christ. Not in Africa, not in California. God put me in that generation to bring me to Christ. It was all part of his plan what he wanted to do. And for Lazarus, Lazarus' life was ordained by God, and God would cause him to cry out for mercy while he was a beggar in all this destitution, that at some point in his life he cried out for mercy from God to save him. This was Lazarus' time to die in God's perfect plan. Now, it's very interesting what's said next. And the angels carried Lazarus to heaven. The Jews believed that when true believers died, they went to Abraham's side, which was their figure for heaven. Abraham, again, was the father of Israel, and they knew he was in heaven, and everybody was going to gather around him. And they considered Abraham the father of their Jewish nation, and thus referred to him oftentimes as Father Abraham. But this whole idea of angels meeting Lazarus and carrying him is new revelation. If you read the word, it's angels, plural. It's not an angel. More than one angel, two angels at least. They meet Christians at the moment of death and take us to heaven. It's always wonderful to read God's word. He can be talking about anything, and he makes a comment. And oftentimes that comment is about a new fact. It's in Isaiah where he talks about that he, God, sits on his throne above the circle of the earth. He was just making a statement. I sit on a throne above the circle of the earth. I think later it talks about the people look like grasshoppers. He's on a throne above the circle of the earth, and if you look up that word circle, it means it's chub, which means sphere. So here, thousands of years ago, before man knew exactly what the shape of the earth was, when they thought it was flat, God made a comment, passing comment, about he was sitting on a throne above this ball. And then another verse shortly thereafter says, by the way, that circle, it's held up by nothing. It's not sitting on a stand, it's there by itself. So again, that casual comment. And here he talks about New Revelation, they were met by angels. So Lazarus, when he died, there were angels who met him at the moment of death to take him to heaven. Now really, that's not surprising if you think about it. You see, at the moment of death, our soul, which is our spirit, leaves our body. A spirit has a mind, it can think, it can move. And we can see that in the angels, which are spirits. We can see it in the demons, which are spirits. And we have spirits, and that that spirit, left alone, could wander around. Now, you would say, if the angels didn't come, how would we get to heaven? How do we know the way to heaven? Do you know where heaven is? Well, it's up. Okay, down on the other part of the world, but it's up. Okay, where? how far up? Where do you turn? Well, we know that uh, Paul tells us that he went to heaven, and he referred to it as the third heaven. Paul went to the third heaven which tells us there must be a first and a second. And he was up in the throne room of God, and God brought him up there for a special purpose. He looked around, 
And he came back. And he was told, matter of fact, that he couldn't say anything about what he, what he saw. Which we know now, it was a great encouragement God gave that great apostle to be because he was going to have a very difficult task in taking the gospel to the Gentiles. But again, going back to the heavens. Okay, so the first heaven, that's easy, right? It's where the birds and the planes fly. It's our atmosphere. The second heaven's outer space. That's easy. And the third heaven is out when you pass outer space. Now, some want to say that outer space, the universe, is, is infinite. There's no end to it. Not true. Matter of fact, the Bible says that God calls each star out by name when he calls them out. Every one. There's, there's a number. And the universe is a big bubble, kind of an oblong bubble out there. And so we're this little dot in there, the earth, very important. And we're there, and we have that little atmosphere, and then we have this universe. And if you could travel far enough and fast enough in some super space capsule you would eventually go out of the universe. There would be a sign, so you are now leaving the universe and you're coming into heaven. Of course, God doesn't let you enter that way, but that's what it is. We're living in the bubble. And God's throne, God's room is outside the bubble. That's the highest heaven. And in there is God. And right now what we know is his city, the new Jerusalem up there. And uh, the angels are there and the saints are there, those who have died before us. So these angels come to him, and they come to pick up Lazarus, not his body, but his spirit, and to take him as a VIP into third heaven and place him next to Abraham. It's one thing that we could look forward to at our death, ideally, that there will be angels who will meet us at the instant of our death, and they will take us to heaven. And ideally, they'll take us right to the face and the arms of Christ. That's our expectation. So Lazarus, being the poor beggar, had a totally different life in eternity. He went into heaven where God lives, and he has this life in heaven where he's there with all the holy angels, all the redeemed of all time are there, from the time of Adam and Eve to the present. It's a place of peace, a place of joy, a place of pleasure, happiness, holiness, righteousness. There's no pain, there's no death, there's no mourning. There's sweet fellowship and love 24-7, no night. No sleeping. If you're thinking about dying and getting some rest, you'll be restful, but you will not sleep. You will not have a bed in heaven. It's an abundant, purposeful life with Jesus Christ. Now, the rich man also had a totally different life in eternity. It says, the rich man also died and was buried. He also died and was buried. And what's the natural question? Where are the angels? Doesn't he get some angels? They're not mentioned But I believe that we can assume that he was met by angels. And these are not smiling angels. And they're not demons. They are holy angels of God, and they're angry. They're agents of God's wrath against the wicked. And where do we have any evidence that the wicked are met by angels and they're not happy? We see that in Matthew 13, 49 to 50, and it says this. This is how it will be at the end of the age. The angels will come and separate the wicked from the righteous. And they will take the wicked and throw them into the fiery furnace where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Again, going back to our understanding of when the spirit leaves the body, it's a free agent. But when a wicked person dies, a rebellious person against God, that soul, that spirit is in rebellion. And it would not seek to find hell where it belongs. And so these angels are there to grab them at the instant of death You have to think about that. Death comes, and sometimes it comes suddenly. I think of that airliner that crashed in Russia, the Boeing 737, yesterday, and all of a sudden, those 62 people are dead in an instant when it plowed into the ground short of the runway. And probably most of them were not believers. There were angels right there at that spot. The flames were still burning, and angels instantly grabbed them, those spirits, and took them, the ones that were not believers, and threw them into hell, a much more worse experience in the crash for us. And those believers who were on there would have rushed into heaven. And then it says the rich man was buried. And this would have been an elaborate funeral. Many friends would have been given an eulogy of his greatness. They would comment how blessed he was to have been chosen by God and how they would miss him, how they would look forward to seeing him again in paradise, heaven. But there's no mention about Lazarus's funeral. And typically, at this time, beggars were often just thrown into the local dump that was normally burning 
along with the criminals. But the irony is that the poor man, Lazarus, was ushered into heaven by glorious angels while his earthly body was being left to burn in the dump, whereas the rich man, with his elaborate funeral and ornate tomb, would not make it to heaven, but would go into hell while his friends were rejoicing that he went to heaven. Verse 23, it says the rich man, talking about the rich man, it said, in hell, where he was in torment, he looked up and saw Abraham far away with Lazarus by his side. Now the great reversal has taken place. Lazarus, the beggar who was thought to be cursed by God and destined for hell, is now in heaven. The rich man who was thought to be blessed by God and on his way to heaven is now in hell. A great reversal took place. And speaking of hell, where he was in torment, the Bible describes hell as a place of many torments. It says it's a place of eternal fire, a fire that never ends. It will burn. Hell will be there for billions, trillions of years. And after that time, you'll have just as much eternity as you had when you started. It will never end. It's a place of complete darkness, even though there's flames. Complete darkness, a place of a burning wind, a place of complete hunger and thirst. It's called a lake of fire later. It's a place of black smoke. It's a place where there's no rest day or night, 24-7, burning and torment. There's places where it indicates that you're suspended. You're not sitting down on anything. You're not standing on anything. You can't move to change the pain or anything or the wrath. You're just there, and you're being tormented because of your rebellion. It says it's a second death that never ends, and it's a place of weeping and gnashing of teeth. It's also a place where the wicked will get new bodies built for the fires, fireproof bodies. They won't burn up, and they will never pass out. You know, God has given us so much mercy. If you encounter some great amount of pain, there's a level where your body will just pass out. It hits that level, it shuts down, you pass out. And that's a gift from God. But here, these bodies will never hit that level. They're designed to fill every bit of the pain and the full measure of the pain. And we can only imagine that they're not beautiful bodies, they're ugly bodies, they're wretched, they're monstrous type bodies. That's what hell is. And it goes on forever. And you ask the question, why does God send people to hell? Why does a loving God do that? Well, it's very simple. He says in 2 Thessalonians 1, 8-9, He will punish those who do not know God and do not obey the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. They will be punished with everlasting destruction. And by the way, hell is not remedial. It's punitive. It is not designed to make anyone better. It doesn't rehabilitate anyone. No, it's nothing but pure punishment for unrepentant sinners. That is, God will pour out his wrath on those who lack a personal relationship with him through Jesus Christ or through the Messiah for the Old Testament. They refuse to obey God's command to repent of their sins and to believe that Jesus Christ is who he claims to be, and they refuse to submit to the Lordship of Christ. God in Acts 4.12 declares that salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to men by which we must be saved. As Jesus said, if you do not believe that I am the one I claim to be, you will indeed die in your sins, and you don't want to die in your sins. That means you take them with you. But he said, you must believe who I claim to be. And he claimed to be the only mediator between God and man. No other. No other person can save you. When you affirm that, you're damning most of the world because you have the Muslims and the Buddhists and the Hindus and the Jews of this age and many other religions who flatly refuse salvation through Christ. And those billions and billions of people at the moment of death, no matter how moral a life they live, no matter how faithful they were to their God, they will go right into the fires if they die believing in that religion. That's what we say, and that's what we mean. The world says that's, that's narrow-minded, but that's the truth of the Scripture. We continue on and says the rich man while he was in hell looked up and saw Abraham far away with Lazarus by his side. Now the rich man who had been in intense torment and utter darkness burning every day in the darkness suddenly sees something he's never seen before. He would have seen a bright light. Heaven opened up for him. This is unusual 
For nowhere in Scripture have we ever read a people in hell can actually see people in heaven. But God does many unusual things in Scripture to accomplish his special purpose. I mean, we had a donkey that talked in a human voice to rebuke Balaam, the wicked prophet. He does things that are very different. It's not the norm, but he does it. But he does it to illustrate something he wants us to learn. We also have Stephen while he was preaching. We talk about who can look up into heaven from the earth or from hell. Stephen was preaching when the crowd became angry at what he was preaching. They decided to kill him. And the Bible says in Acts 7.55, Stephen looked up to heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. Look, he said to the crowd, I see heaven open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. He saw that. While on earth, he looked into heaven. God allowed him to. We also know again the Apostle Paul was taken up to heaven and saw inexpressible things and wasn't allowed to say anything, but he went to heaven. That's unusual. And the Apostle John, really unusual. Paul wasn't allowed to say anything. John was taken up to heaven, and we read about in the book of Revelation, and not only saw what it looked like, but was also given revelations about all the future events coming on the end of the world and the future world to come. And he was commanded to write it all down for us to know in the book of Revelation. So the rich man in hell could see into heaven, at least for this short duration. And God has allowed this to illustrate his point that he was trying to make with the religious leaders and the elite of Israel. Now he was shocked at what he saw. The rich man was shocked, no doubt. He saw Abraham sitting there, and next to him, in a place of high honor, was the former beggar, Lazarus and that he wasn't in hell, but he was in heaven with Abraham, sitting right next to him. So after years of complete darkness and torment, he then opens his mouth and makes a request. The rich man did. It says in verse 24, So the rich man called to him. He said, Father Abraham, have pity on me and send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue because I am in agony in this fire. He calls him Father Abraham. He shows a respect for Father Abraham. He's not angry at Father Abraham. He's not angry at God. He shows respect. He's no longer warring against God. He's no longer sinning against God. He's submissive to the God of the universe. Oh, he's not saved, but he's no longer sinning. He accepts the punishment due him, and he shows utter respect and honor for God. And what does he say to Father Abraham? Have pity on me. Have mercy on me. He knows he has no rights in hell. He's aware he is, is where he belongs. But his first request is for himself. He's asking Abraham, and he wants him to send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in water and then come over into hell and put a drop on his tongue because he's in agony in the fire. And he only wants a drop of water. He doesn't want a bucket of water. He doesn't want a fire hose, just a drop of water. He wants some relief, anything, tiny bit of relief from his suffering. And again, we note this great reversal. Lazarus wanted just a crumb from the rich man's table on earth, which he never received. And now the rich man wants just a drop of water from Lazarus, which he will not receive. And the reason for the request, he said, because I am in agony in this fire, which confirms the agonies of hell. Now, sometimes we can ask the question, why did this rich man go to hell? It's not because he was rich. And this is not a story about the rich versus the poor. It's not because he was rich. Rich people go to heaven. It's difficult. Jesus says it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a tiny little needle. But then all things were possible with God. But Abraham was very rich. Job was very rich. Joseph, the rich man from Arimathea, gave his new tomb to Jesus for his burial. He was a believer. But why did this rich man go to hell? He went to hell because he was never saved. He refused to repent of his sins. He refused to believe in the coming Messiah. And he refused to submit his will to God's word. He also showed no mercy to Lazarus. So the rich man's request for the water is denied. Abraham said, Son, remember, in your lifetime you received good things, and Lazarus received bad things. But now he is comforted, and you are in agony. And besides all this, between us and you... A great chasm has been fixed, so that those who want to go from here to you cannot, nor can anyone cross from there to us. So he denied him that water. But he did say, remember. And again, we talked about it, that there's memory in hell, and there'll also be memory in heaven. I know in the book of Revelation it talks about 
when you go to heaven, the former things will not be remembered. So you think, I'm not going to remember anything. Oh yeah, you're going to remember. You have to remember. How could you walk around heaven if everything that you ever learned is gone? And you'd walk around and you'd see the new Jerusalem with its 12 gates, and on each gate made out of a single pearl. They were the names of the patriarchs of the tribes of Israel. You wouldn't know who they are. And you've seen the 12 foundation stones on the foundation of the Father's house, the new Jerusalem, and it had the names of the apostles. If you didn't have any memory, you wouldn't even know what they meant. You have memory. You won't bring the bad memories. You won't bring the wicked things. But you'll bring memory. You'll know people that you meet. You're going to see Rahab. You're going to see David. You're going to see Adam. You're going to see Eve. You're going to see Charles Spurgeon and J.C. Ryle and Whitfield, some of the great preachers of all time. They're going to be there. You're going to recognize them. How are you going to recognize them? Just like the rich man recognized Abraham. God's going to make sure you recognize them. First indication of those in hell, when he said, remember, as they still have their memories, will only prove to increase their torment as they remember the lost opportunities that they had to be saved. They'll remember when somebody tried to share the truth with them. People in hell today who had heard the gospel and heard the gospel, they are burning now. They have that constant memory of what they lost. They will hate themselves for the sins that they have committed and have increased the torments. And he tells them, remember in your lifetime you received good things and Lazarus the bad things. The rich man had a vivid picture of the great reversal that often happens at death. In life he had everything good, everything he wanted, a comfortable life, while Lazarus had nothing, not even food, and an agonizing life of pain and hunger. And now Lazarus is in an unbelievable comfort and joy, while the rich man has nothing but extreme agony. And then he talks about this great chasm. There's a great gap that exists between heaven and hell, and you can't cross it, and you never will be able to cross it. How big is the gap? How big is the gap? Well, you get an idea when the Bible declares that to the end of time, as we know it, right before the great white throne judgment in the book of Revelation, chapter 20, God will remove every person off the planet, and then on that day, God will destroy this entire universe. Second Peter chapter 3, verse 12 talks about this, and the ESV has the best translation, and it says, The heavens will be set on fire and dissolved, and the heavenly bodies will melt as they burn. Oftentimes it's asked, well, how would that come about where everything just burns, it just melts? Well, scientists say they don't really understand what holds an atom together. By rights, it just come apart and have nuclear explosions all over the place. But the Bible also says that Jesus holds all things together by his power. And all he has to do is let the atoms go, and everything will melt. It's all gone. All your wealth, all your things, Virginia, everything's gone. So that happens right before the great white throne judgment. Then he judges everybody. The wicked have their day in court. Of course, they're already condemned to hell. They just get their final punishment allotted to them. And they're all thrown, as it says there in Revelation, that the judge on the throne, which is Jesus Christ, takes each individual unbeliever who had come out of hell and had their judgment. He then throws them into the lake of fire. He doesn't guide them. He doesn't direct them. He doesn't place them in hell. And some people say, I have a hard time with that. It's not a loving God who throws with anger an unbeliever in hell. Zoom in. Zoom in on the hands of the one who just threw him in there. Look at his hands real close and see the nail scars. Zoom in on his side, see the, where the spear went. Zoom in on his feet and see the nail prints. He offered them his mercy and they spit in his face and now they get his wrath because he is a just God. So the present universe is destroyed. And after everybody's thrown into the lake of fire, in Revelation 21, it says God now creates a new heaven and a new earth. A new universe is coming into play. One that will never experience sin and the curse that was in this present universe. Now the assumption we can make very clearly is that hell will not be inside that universe because nothing that is cursed or wicked could ever come in that new universe. So it has to be somewhere outside the new universe, which will be quite a gap. No one could ever bridge that. So thus far, we've seen two different lives on earth. We've seen the, the death came and changed everything. And now we, for the end here, we see two different gospels believed. And the first gospel is man's false gospel, the gospel that condemned the rich man to hell. It's a gospel of salvation by miracles, salvation by works, 
or by any external actions. It's man's gospel. It doesn't include faith in Jesus Christ. It doesn't include his sovereign work of salvation. And we see this when he, he tells Father Abraham, he begs him now as another request, I have five brothers. Could you send Lazarus to warn them so that they will not come to this place of torment? Not only does he have memory, but there's another amazing thing here, is he showed compassion for his brothers. That seems odd, because he was a man who showed no compassion to this beggar who deserved compassion. And here he is now having compassion. Usually misery loves company. And you know, if I'm here, then you should come here too. But he doesn't want them to come. And what changed is at the moment of death was that sudden realization of his true state. I've always thought of it as the blinders were removed like from a horse. Suddenly you see at the moment of death. And as an unbeliever, you see that you are a wretched sinner and you've offended a holy God and that you will be punished 24-7 for all of eternity and that there will never, ever, ever be another offer of salvation. There will never be any more mercy. There will be no Savior. And you are condemned because you refuse to love the truth and so be saved. He knows that he is rightly deserving the punishment he is receiving. And he's not shaking his fist at God. It doesn't make it any easier. It makes it even worse because he has to live with that despair. I had a hard time with the doctrine of hell when I became a new Christian because it was so over the top. You know, I can see being in heaven forever and ever and ever and billions and trillions and gazillion of years. But to know that these people are in hell and they're going to be there for all of time. But you don't see it as God sees it. They had the chance. They refused the mercy. And now they get what they deserve, and that is the justice of God. So that's man's false gospel. We see it again in verse 30 where he he repeats it. He argues with uh, Abraham, and he tries to tell him that if someone from the dead goes to them, they will repent. And again, he doesn't understand that salvation is by faith alone in the chosen Redeemer. He believes that if someone just rises from the dead, they will believe, but they didn't. Because another Lazarus was raised from the dead. And what did the Pharisees do once they found out Lazarus was raised from the dead? They said, we have to kill Jesus. We have to kill Jesus. Things are getting out of hand. It never works. But the true gospel we see in verse 29, in the reply that Abraham gave back to the rich man on both of his requests, he kept saying, they have Moses and the prophets. Let them listen to them. Moses and the prophets is a Jewish expression referring to the Old Testament. And the reason why people don't go to heaven in the Old Testament is that they don't listen to Scripture. You must listen and obey the way of salvation presented in the Scripture, both in the Old Testament and the New Testament. And the New Testament is easy. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 says, It is by grace you have been saved through faith. It is not of yourself. It is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. And it tells us in Romans 10, 7 that faith comes from hearing the message, and the message is about Christ. In the Old Testament, it was the same story. They had to believe in God as their creator. They had to believe that God was a holy judge. They had to understand that they were a sinner and they defended an all-holy God. They had to repent of their sin and they would be saved by the grace of God through faith, not by works. They knew a Redeemer was coming. They knew He was coming. They saw the blood sacrifice. They knew that there had to be the shedding of blood had to take place, but it wasn't going to be an animal. It had to be a person. The Messiah, that was their Redeemer. And we see in Job 19.25 how clear he understood. He said, I know that my Redeemer lives and that in the last day he will stand upon the earth. And Isaiah said, the Redeemer will come to Zion to those in Jacob who repent of their sins. So that's the true gospel. And it was reiterated when he asked him to send him to his brothers a second time. And he said again, Abraham said, if they don't listen to Moses and the prophets, they won't be convinced, even if someone rises from the dead. And that's the end of the dialogue. It's the end of the story. And the lights go out for the rich man in hell. The lights are out. It gets dark. And he's been there for the last couple thousand years, burning in that torment, and he will remain there. The story closes. It's over. Now, there's a one final note, and that is, did you notice what the rich man never asked for? He asked for water. He asked for someone to go save his brothers. But he never asked to get out. He never asked for mercy. He never asked to be taken out. He didn't say, I believe, I believe, I believe. Take me out of here. He didn't say it. 
because he knows. He knows the day is over. And again, that, that's got to bring great despair over the years. So we have received the warning from hell that not everyone who thinks they're going to heaven will get there. And the determining factor is the gospel we trust in. Have we been truly saved by grace? That is the gift of faith that comes as we hear the message about Christ. You have to hear the message about Christ. And not only do we have to examine our own hearts, because Jesus made a comment once where he says, many, many, as we read earlier, will say in that day, Lord, Lord, let us in. We went to church. We did Bible studies. We read our Bibles. And he says, I never knew you. There's a lot of people who think they're going to heaven, but they're not. We want to make sure that our calling and election sure because death comes so quickly. That's what I do when I share the gospel with people. I constantly remind them how quick death can come. You know, we saw it with the Boeing 737 that just crashed. Those people, they held for two hours due to the bad weather. And yet that pilot still continued on in the bad weather and crashed and killed them. But they didn't intend to die when they got on that airplane. I have a friend of mine who pulled up the stoplight on his way to work and it was two lanes. And he's always the guy that shoots out in the intersection as soon as the light turns green. And at that day, he pulls up there, he's at the light, a car pulls up next to him, he looks over, and there's a woman. He just glanced over, there was a woman sitting there. The light changed, he dropped something, he reached down to get it. She shot out in the intersection, was T-boned by a semi-truck, died instantly. It happens so quickly. So we have to be sure we're saved. And lastly, if you are sure of your salvation, then please, please warn others. If you woke up in the middle of the night, and you looked out the window, you heard something, or you just happened to look out, and you saw your neighbor's house across the street was on fire. Fire was coming out of the windows. And you knew your neighbors were there sleeping. What would you do? Would you get up and run across the street and beat on the door, kick it down if you have to, go in there at the risk of your own life and try to save them? You should. Or would you just go back to bed? Well, we look around and we see it in the workplace, we see it in our neighborhood, we see it in our relatives. There's lost people everywhere. And they're going into hell, and we know it, and they don't know it. And we need to have that burden to pray. Find those people that you see all the time, people that you work with, you see them every day, the people in your neighborhood that you know, and pray for them particularly. Pray and pray and pray that God...